Father God, first of all, we thank you just for who you are and the fact that you've revealed yourself to us through your word and you love us and you care for us and you are tender and gracious and slow to anger and full of mercy and forgiveness. Secondly, Lord, we lift up this uh, mission trip to Liberia that you would go before them, prepare the, the places they're going to go, the hearts of the people they'll be touching. We pray, Lord, for financial provision, for safety, and most of all, that they would be an effective and uh, fervently working hard team when they get there. And Lord, for Said and Nagme, you know exactly what's going on. We don't know. It's not our place to know. It's not our place to talk about it. But our place is to pray for them, to um, ask for forgiveness, and then to receive that, and then to move on, and to reunite them in what can be the marriage bond that is so wonderful and beautiful as we've seen with so many couples. And Lord, I just generically pray for marriages in our fellowship. I just feel the leading. So pray that you would work in the hearts and the minds of every person here who's married, that they would draw closer and closer to you, which will in turn encourage them, help them, and enable them to draw closer to their spouse. Now, Lord, we're going to look to your word and see what you have for us from that today fantastic book especially the book of romans we've been looking at and i pray you give us clear understanding into what you had paul write so many years ago in jesus name amen okay so we're going to be in the book of romans in chapter seven today now i want to ask you have you ever been watching a movie and maybe you think you have the plot figured out only to watch the rest of the movie and find out you're wrong has that ever happened to you where they they twist the plot now, there are two, two ways to look at that. You can be mad, or you can say, aha, clever guy, I kind of like that. That's, I didn't expect that. Or, you know, there are times when I'll think differently than everybody else in the room. Maybe we'll pause it and have a quick discussion, and they're like, why did you pause it? Just play. So I don't want to talk about this. Anyway, it's the strangeness of my house, you don't want to live there. But anyway, so... <laughs> anyway, oh my goodness. If you're visiting, apologize. Anyway, so... Um, <laughs> But there are times when I I think it'll go one way and everybody else thinks it goes another and it goes the way I thought it was going to go. And I'm like, yeah, I figured it out. So anyway, the whole point is it's kind of sneaky sometimes. Or maybe you've read a book, a mystery or a a novel that somebody wrote or something, and you think you have it figured out and you get to the end and you go, wow, I did not expect that. Or maybe even this, something as simple as somebody tells you a joke and the punchline is different than you expected and it catches you off guard and you really laugh. Because the unexpected twist is funnier than you imagined. Well, that's the whole idea I'm getting at. The surprise factor is what I'm getting at. And today, our surprise involves sin and the law. In fact, I call this message today, That Sneaky Law. Okay, we'll pick it up in chapter 7, verse 1. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another." To him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What should we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life... I found to bring death for sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. 
So he starts off in verse 1, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? Now, first of all, when he says, do you not know, in other words, you do know this, don't you? Right? Okay, you do. But what is he talking about? First of all, he's talking to the brethren. The brethren he's speaking to are Jews. Now, he's talking to the Jews. The Jews are those who know the law, because he says, I speak to those who know the law. But beware. Don't think, oh, good, I'm not Jewish. None of this applies. I can take off or take a nap. No, no, no. <laughs> Most of this, pretty much all of it applies to us. You just got to run it through the filter of Gentile, Jew, God, law, sin. You'll see. But to Paul's other point, the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. This makes sense because the law will be there whether we are alive or dead. But when we die, the law no longer applies to us. The law he's talking about, the Ten Commandments and all the books of the Old Testament that spread out and talked about all the different things in the law. But think about this just in the natural laws that we have today. How many caskets do you see in courtrooms? Probably zero. How many deceased people have been offered traffic citations? How many people who have passed away have been sentenced to jail time? How many dead people have voted? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. That one might have happened. But... <laughs> Whoa. Anyway, except for the last example, which doesn't really fit, it's just meant for a joke, the answer is none. There are no caskets in courtrooms, traffic citations from people who have passed away, or deceased people have been sentenced to jail time. Once a person dies, all criminal actions involving them come to an end. I was just reading on the internet yesterday about the tragedy, the terrible thing that those two high schoolers did at Columbine High. And then they committed suicide. Did they prosecute those two kids? They couldn't because they were dead. But until then, everyone is under the law. So beginning in verse 2, Paul uses marriage as an example. This is important to recognize. It's an example to illustrate his point. This is in no way intended by Paul to be the all-encompassing teaching on marriage and divorce and widows, widowers and, and or remarriage. None of that's intended by Paul. In fact, Jesus himself gave a lot better teaching on marriage. And then there are other sections where Paul addresses marriage, and he is addressing marriage. He's using marriage as an example, so please don't read into it. This is the only way that a divorce can happen, or not a divorce, but a remarriage. That's not what he's talking about. He's using a relationship that is easily understood, especially in the way the Jews, to whom he's writing, understood it in his day. And it's as an example to illustrate his point about the relationship between God and his law and us. So, here's what he wrote, verses 2 and 3. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. I mean, that's pretty clear. Husband and wife, wife can't divorce him, but if he dies, she can remarry. If she divorces him and marries someone else, she's considered an adulteress. That's what Paul is saying. He chose this example very carefully. Remember, he's talking to Jews when he wrote this. Now, in this section on marriage that Jesus taught in Matthew 19, he talked about the example of a man divorcing his wife because the Pharisees came up and said, Tell us, teacher, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Which it was for them. That's what they had, the two teachings. The one was only extreme circumstances. The other one was like, anything you want. She burnt the toast. I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. She's gone. I mean, it was that simple. So Jesus came at it from the husband's point of view, and that's, that's the teaching. But, and he was correct in doing that in their society. But here in Romans 7... Paul chooses the other side of the coin. He's looking at it from the woman's side for a very specific reason. And it's because in their society, a husband could divorce his wife for any reason, almost, but a wife could not divorce her husband for any reason. She was bound for life. She had no way out, even if she desperately wanted one. But if her husband died, well, then she was free to marry another. That was the only scenario that allowed her to leave the relationship from the woman's point of view. The big point Paul is carefully making is the bound for life point. He's not saying 
marriage applies to this. He's saying bound for life. Take that part out of that example and place it in here. Leave the rest for another teaching, another time, okay? So I don't want you to read that and go, oh, okay? Because there are a lot of other things. We're not going to get into marriage and divorce here. We're just using that bound for life point. And what he's about to do is apply that example to how we were bound to the law for life. Okay, now in his example, the wife is alive and she's free to marry another, right? Because if the husband dies, then she's free to get married to someone else. She's freed up. A natural conclusion we could come to in Paul's example for us relating to the law is that just as the husband died, it has to be the law that died freeing us to marry someone else because we're still alive. We didn't die. But that's not where Paul goes with this. (laughs) Because the law has not died. The law is just as alive then and today as it always has been. So you're like, good, because it'll explain it next. The only other conclusion we can come to is this in verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead, and me, to the law, become dead to the law through the body of Christ. Instead of the law dying, we are the ones who died. Remember in chapter 6, verse 6, Paul said, Our old man was crucified with him. And ladies, that doesn't mean your husband or you guys talking about your dad, my old man. No, that's not it. The old nature, us, when Jesus' body physically died on the cross, we as Christians died with him. The old man, the old man died. And because of that, the law has no dominion over us. Remember, there are no caskets in a courtroom. So the law has no dominion over the old man. And that frees you up. The what? That you may be married to another. So now that we're dead to the law, through the body of Christ, we're free to marry someone else. Though, who would that be? Don't the old saying, there's a lot of fish in the sea, right? (laughs) To whom should I get married? Paul addresses it near the end of verse 4. To him who was raised from the dead has to be Jesus Christ. That's who he's talking about. We as believers are known in Revelation 19, verses 7 through 9, as the bride of Christ. It's hard for guys to wrap their brains around that. I ain't wearing no white gown with a train, carrying the bouquet, shooting the garter. There's even a marriage supper that we attend in heaven, which is also talked about in Revelation 19, verse 9. But that we should bear fruit to God is the reason for the whole thing. This is our part to play. We have things to do. God has freed us from the law that we should bear fruit to God. Rather than working at obeying the law to make God happy, we're not under that law. We're free by his death so we can bear fruit to God. Now, the whole wedding, bride of Christ, Jesus is the bridegroom thing, it's a lot like a Jewish wedding. Now, I don't know, you may not know this, but in Jesus' time, there were three stages to a Jewish wedding or a Jewish marriage, actually. The first stage was the engagement. This was a formal arrangement agreed to by the fathers of the two parties, the bride and groom. The second was called the betrothal. This is the ceremony where mutual promises are made by each side. This is the stage that Mary and Joseph, the parents, will marry the mother and Jesus, basically stepfather of Jesus, this is where they were, where they were betrothed. They'd gone through a ceremony, but they hadn't actually physically joined, which they didn't do yet in their society in the sexual union until the next stage, which is marriage. Approximately one year later, when the bridegroom came at an unexpected time for his bride. Now, During the betrothal time, the bridegroom would prepare a place for his bride, usually by adding on to his family home. Where he lived, he'd put on a room addition, basically. Now, this is so cool, because when the father told him, all the preparations are done, you're finished, go get your bride. They would sound a trumpet, and then he would go and get his bride, and they would have the wedding ceremony, the marriage Now, while all this was going on, the bride was to remain faithful to her bridegroom the entire time he was working on their place. And she had no idea when he would come, so she always had to be ready. But she could tell he was coming when she heard the trumpet sound. Then the bridegroom would come for his bride, they would get married, then they'd go to the place that he'd prepared for them and stay in there for seven days and just enjoy each other. And then after that, at the end of the seventh day, he would come out and present his bride 
to the townspeople as his wife. Now, if, if you're a student of Scripture at all, if you're familiar with Christianity, if you know what's going to happen with us, it's very much the same thing for us as believers because first, we become engaged to the Lord because of an agreement basically that God makes, what we call his plan of salvation. We get introduced to him. Then we become betrothed to him when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. We know that he has gone to prepare a place for us and he will one day return for us sounding a trumpet to announce his return. And during this time of waiting, we don't know when he's going to return, so we have to remain faithful and be ready at any time that we should bear fruit to God. And then third, when we get married to him, he takes us to heaven to be with him forever. We will be safe in heaven, in the place he went to prepare for us for seven years, which is during the time of the great tribulation on the earth, And at the end of the seven years, we emerge with him as he presents us to the world, and then we will rule and reign with him. It's very similar to the Jewish wedding. But for now, while we're waiting, we are to bear fruit to God, which is doing things for him from our hearts in response to his great love for us. Rather than seeing the duty of obeying the law, we just see things and do them because God's leading us and he enables us because he loves us so much. Okay, so back to the text and the points that Paul is making. In verse 5, For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Man, that does not sound good. Paul's talking about our past, the time before we were Christians. The law was there, and in a lot of ways we were aware of it, but but what we didn't realize was this. The law aroused in us sinful passions that bore fruit. Not sweet, wonderful fruit, as I talked about last time, but what I call stinky fruit. (laughs) Been on the counter too long, got the little fruit flies buzzing around, got the mold growing, got the sinking feeling going on. You know, you've seen it used to be a nice round thing, and now it's kind of... (laughs) Plums are really good at that. They they look like they age. because they get wrinkly? You know, they're all... Oh, I like my face. It used to be all smooth. Now I look at pictures from high school. I'm like, I don't know if I had a wrinkle when I bent my arm. But now I just stand there and it's like, can't count them all. <laughs> but anyway, fruit here means conduct rewarded with death. That's not the kind of fruit you want to produce. Because in verse 4, the good fruit means conduct producing fruit that's acceptable to God. That's got to be good stuff. So in our old lives, the only conduct we had would produce death, which is not only physical death, of course, sin does, but eternal death, which people don't like to talk about. What we call hell, the Bible calls being cast into the lake of fire. (sighs) So, I love this, because in verse 6, Paul starts it with two words, two great words. But now, this means something different. Something new, but now, but now, but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by. See, we could not and did not even deliver ourselves from the law. It's evident from the fact the law is still here. We couldn't kill it off. We couldn't get rid of it. We couldn't say, I don't want to go by it. Too bad. It's there. Jesus Christ himself delivered us from the law by fulfilling it himself. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus himself said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And you see, Jesus is the one who fulfilled all of it. He lived by the law. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt, all these things, murder, adultery, keeping God, everything first. He lived by it all and never sinned. So the law was appeased, taken care of in the life of Jesus for us. And this is true too. Our old man died with Jesus on the cross, which frees us from the law. Basically, Paul said this, if we're dead, the law has no jurisdiction over us. (laughs) Because our old man died, the law is no longer over us, as in obeying it to make God happy. You don't have to do that. But what now? We still behave ourselves, don't we? We have to behave somehow. It's one of my favorite sayings I say to my wife when I'm acting in a manner that is inappropriate to her. 
She says, behave yourself. I say, I am. Just not the way you want me to behave. <laughs> We're always behaving ourselves one way or another. There's stuff we do, whether it's good in other people's eyes or bad or neutral or makes you say, boy, I am glad I am not married to that person. Boy, I'm glad that's not my kid. Boy, I'm glad I can get in the car and drive away. <laughs> Whatever. you know. Or I wish they were part of my family. Whatever you see, behavior happens. We're still alive. We have to still interact with the world. But now, because we're dead to the law, we are now alive to God. And he guides us and he directs our behavior. The rest of verse 6 says, So that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Rather than trying to keep the letter of the law, which is so tiring, and by the way, it's impossible to do, we are now free in Christ to love him and serve him. Now, when we got saved, the Holy Spirit came into our hearts. Listen to this. Instead of trying in vain to obey rules written on stone, we are free to obey rules written on our hearts. Rather than trying to obey this in a way we think of rude, crude, mean, stone. We think written in stone is good, but if it's going to fall on you, that big two stone tablets, man, how about something written on your heart? Where does behavior really come from? Where do you think it? I mean, there are reactions and then there's behavior, of course, and you can react quickly like that, but still out of the heart. What if the law of God, the rules, the behavior, the direction, the love, the care, the mercy, the grace, the forgiveness is all written on your heart? How is that going to affect how you react? Since the behavior comes from the inside out, it's going to be redirected. You have to go away from, what's that in computers? The default. The default setting is sin. The default setting is self. The default setting, you have to have that hard drive taken out. And put in a new one where the default setting is love. The default setting is forgiveness. The default setting is peace and joy. and All these wonderful things that God provides us with by having it written on our hearts. It's so much better than the law that's exterior. He wants it to be interior. Now, Paul is a pretty smart guy. He knows people will still come at this from another angle trying to condemn the law. Or they might even try to interpret what he's saying as the fact that he's condemning the law. That he's saying the law is evil. So the first part of verse 7, what should we say then? Is the law sin? If I can steal an interpretation from Curly and the Three Stooges, certainly not. (laughs) On the contrary, I would have not known sin except through the law. So here it is, the essence, the reason for the law. The law is not sin, nor is it sinful. It just points out sin. Here's an example of what the law does, I think. Hopefully this will work for you. Suppose you had in your possession... A bottle of poison. If you don't have poison around your house, probably good. But if you did, what if this bottle were unmarked? So you put a label on it. There are many labels available. The one you choose is vanilla extract. And you put it in the spice cabinet. Someone comes over, makes cookies. Oh, vanilla extract. They put it in. People who eat the cookies will either get sick or get sick and die because it's poison. Now, you know what the law does? All the law does is it puts the correct label on the bottle. That's all the law does. Boom. Poison. And the law calls sin, cleverly enough, sin. It doesn't call it a mistake. It doesn't call it an affair. It's adultery. Well, I kind of like the affair part better. It sounds like a lot more fun. Adultery, it sounds evil. It is! You know, (laughs) I didn't steal it. I just borrowed it for the rest of my life. Okay, all right. I didn't kill him. He just, his life ended when the bullet from my gun went through his head. I mean, you know what I'm saying? These people try to whitewash it. The law says sin is sin. It's it's our hearts that are drawn away to want to disobey the law. So what do we do? It says poison, we ingest it anyway. As Adam Savage's t-shirt says on Mythbusters, I reject your reality and substitute my own. The reality is it's sin. We call it any number of other things. But the bottom line is whatever you call it, it's what it is. You know, I used to, t- I used to volunteer out at the uh, uh, Maximum Security Institution, IMSI, as a pastor. I was teaching uh, what we, uh, they started calling them devotions 
early twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'd go out and, and minister between 7 and 8, I think it was. But anyway, the point is this. Before we even got started, I got a call from the chaplain. He says, um, there's been a change. I thought, okay. What's that? He goes, we can't call them devotions anymore. I said, okay. He says, why don't we call them inspirations? We can't call them devotions because it sounds too biblical, I guess. I said, well, call it the pizza hour. I don't care, but I'm going to be reading from the Bible when I'm there. It doesn't matter what you call it. It's still the same thing I'm going to be doing. It doesn't matter what you call sin. It's still sin, okay? So there you go. The rest of verse 7. Because he's calling sin, sin. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Now, how many commandments are there in the, in the top list, right? It's 10. Why did Paul pick covetousness? Why do you suppose he chose that as an example? It's the last one. And it's different from the other nine because it's an inward attitude, not an outward action. And the reason it's an inward attitude not in, and the other ones are outward actions is because of this. It's the inward attitude that leads to the other actions. It always does. Covetousness is a gradually progressive sin that a lot of people never recognize in their own lives. But God's law reveals it. So Paul chose it because it actually leads to complete lawlessness. And I bet this blew Paul away when he first found that out. Because I bet he thought he was just such a nice Jewish boy. He's such a nice Jewish boy. He does so well. Obeying the laws on the outside. I bet this was a crusher to him. Because he realized his thought life was incredibly sinful. And I thought I was doing so well, God. <laughs> and now he tells us how sinful he actually was in verse 8. But taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. So once Paul be became aware of how his own heart coveted, he realized that coveting led to more and more and more sin. It's just progressive. Now, coveting is to long for, to lust after, to desire more of that which you already have enough. So you may already have enough of whatever you're coveting, but you want more. And it's not yours to want that. Now, desire is a desire, craving, longing, or a desire for what is forbidden. Lust. Now, in the King James Version, now when we hear the word lust in our society, a lot of us think of sexual things. And that's not incorrect. But you can also lust after someone's car. You can lust after their job, their clothes, their position in society. It's just the desire for something else. But in this case, in the, in the King James Version, instead of desire, it's concupiscence, which is a weird word, which is one of the reasons why they don't use it now. But this is what that means. An ardent desire, usually for sex. So what Paul is saying is, as soon as I heard not to covet, all these evil sexual desires started going through my brain. Isn't that amazing? You think of Paul and you think, really? He revealed that? God, you are tough on your followers, aren't you? <laughs> to make them write that in the word. It's incredible. But this obviously is not good. And not just desires, but evil desires. Now, even more, the word opportunity, by take, but taking opportunity by the commandment, in the original Greek, it's a military term, meaning a base of operations. So until he heard about thou shalt not covet, he was okay. As soon as he heard thou shalt not covet, all of a sudden, in his brain, sin set up this operation center, this base of operations, and it used the commandment to produce many of evil desires, like pushing buttons, like, like uh, mission control at Houston. It's going on in your brain. There was none of that before you're told not to. As soon as you're told not to, all of a sudden, whoop, whoop, all the screens light up, the computers come out, and there are little guys with little head things in, you know, in their ear, and the microphones are so you're talking to each other. All that's going on, you're like, man, why did I have to be told that? I didn't know that. I didn't want to know. It frustrated him, I'm sure. But had Paul not known about the law against coveting, apart from the law, sin was what? Dead. At one time, he didn't know about coveting, so he didn't covet much. But as soon as he heard about it, he couldn't stop coveting. Covet, 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 covet. I had a friend who used to say that. It's funny. You pull up in a newer car or a new car. We say newer because most of us couldn't afford a new car. But you get a car that he might like, he could look at it, he'd go, what do you think of my car? And he'd go, covet, covet, covet. 
He just flat out said it. <laughs> just covet, covet. And he put his hands out like this. Covet, covet, covet. <laughs> he just said, hey, Mom, we'll just call it what it is, man. I'd like that car. Do you want the payment? No. All of a sudden, I repent of my covetousness. <laughs> and the law did its job because it, then what did it show Paul? He needed a savior, which is what the law is really supposed to do. Now, the Believer's Bible Commentary says this. The sinful nature is like a sleeping dog. When the law comes and says, don't, dog wakes up and goes on a rampage doing excessively what it's forbidden to do. So it's like, what do they say about sleeping dogs a lot of times? Let them lie. Just let, let the sleeping dog lie. Don't let them, don't wake him up. You wake him up, boom, you never know how it's going to react. So the sleeping dog was covetousness. And when the, the law said, don't covet, boom, all of a sudden it started doing everything. Have you ever longed to do something after someone told you you couldn't? Don't lie. It's one of the ten. <laughs> don't do that. As they say, don't go there. <laughs> don't do that because it's true. We do. And if nothing else, when mom or somebody, Aunt Mary or even Uncle John could do it, bakes all those cookies and they smell so good and you can't have them and they're on the counter and you're little, your arm wants to go up there and find Ooh, that's one still warm. You to call you? <laughs> yeah, so the coveting just comes. Any sin, when we're told not to, immediately someone's like, well, who died and made you God? You know, try saying that to him. See how well that goes, how that, go, how that works out for you, as they say. So verse 9, I was alive once without the law. We know that in Philippians chapter 3, another book in the Bible, verses 4 through 6, Paul describes how he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He followed the law to the letter. He did everything right on the outside. So in that sense, he was alive at one time. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Once he heard the law, sin revived and he died. Now, Paul realized the interpretation of God's law by man was very different than God's intent was. Because Jesus covered that in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you guys have heard that you shouldn't murder. That's good. But I tell you this, if you look at somebody and hate him, you've already killed him in your heart. You've heard you shall not commit adultery. That's good. But guys, women, if you ever look at another person and lust after them physically... You've already committed adultery in your heart. See, the problem is you can do stuff on the outside and look good and follow the letter of the law, but inside you are dying to do that. But on the outside you never would because, first of all, you don't want to get caught. You know it's wrong, but you can think about it because, you know, like the... Like the here's another excuse that people use. I'm not going to do that, but I can window shop. I'm just looking. Well, Jesus says just looking is sinning. <laughs> It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. That's why the law has to be written on the heart because on the inside works its way out. So on the inside, you aren't thinking those things because you know the Bible says no. God says no, you're better off not to do that. It's a sin too. So some people say, well, if I think it and it's a sin, why don't I just do it too? Well, that's two sins. You're just dogpiling on yourself, just piling on. <laughs> it doesn't, it, it, that logic doesn't work. Now, Paul may not have killed anyone, but he certainly must have gotten angry enough to do it. He didn't commit adultery about it, but he thought about it, especially the way he revealed himself. And when he realized it, he died of sorts because the law does what? Condemns us. You break it, you die. And again, Paul states in verse 10 that the law is good. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. Paul thought that obeying the law made him alive, but the more he tried to keep it, the more of it brought death. Now, why does sin do this? It just seems so unfair to us. <laughs> it's because sin is deceptive. Sin promises satisfaction and it promises to relieve us, bring us relief. You guys ever suffered from poison ivy? Oh, if you haven't, you are so blessed. Maybe there's something else you can compare it to, but I don't think so. Because I've gotten into that a few times. One time I was doing a plumbing job, and they just moved a, a portable classroom at a private school out near Hidden Springs, a very nice neighborhood. And they put a portable class, a few portable classrooms to start a school. And so I went underneath them to hook up dra the drains and stuff as a plumber. Well, I didn't know that they had just 
when they leveled all the plants, all the stems that were sticking up that were oozing stuff were poison ivy or poison oak, whichever it was. And I had coveralls on, but they pulled up, and that stuff got on my legs. And wow, I got a bad case. And of course, I didn't know, and didn't, didn't, you didn't, didn't wash enough, got into bed. Christina got it from me. She was so happy. <laughs> and the insurance wouldn't cover her. They'd just cover me, so I had to share my medication and all this. But I'll tell you, the desire to scratch is strong, and you want to scratch. But when you scratch, it doesn't really relieve the itch. It only makes it worse, and the area gets damaged when you scratch it because you're trying to dig your fingernails through to the other side of your leg. You're like, stop it. And then you look down, and you have these red streaks, and it's bleeding. And you're like, oh, and it itches. Sin is like that. It promises what it cannot deliver, and it only brings death. The more we try to obey, the worse we fail. In our fight against sin, the law can only condemn us. Paul gets even clearer in verse 11. For sin, take an occasion by the commandment. In other words, it found an opportunity. It deceived me, and by it, killed me. Here, once again, we see the law is not the problem. The law only points out sin. But because it takes occasion by the commandment, It deceives us. Sin is deceptive. It's a deceiver. And sin is so bad that it'll use anything it can to convince us to commit it. Even the law of God, the holy, perfect law of God. Sin will use that law of God. And that law of God is designed to point out sin. And it uses it to condemn us when we do sin. Years ago, I wrote a parody of Dr. Seuss's One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish. And I call it instead, one sin, two sin, I sin, you sin. And one section, by the way, I don't know if you know that, that's, that's like a total ADD book. You could tear half the pages out, you wouldn't know they were missing. You could t- randomly, because almost every page is a different thought and idea. But anyway, I wrote a section near the end and it says, you cannot win the fight with sin as long as you live in your skin. It takes more than your discipline. Oh, can I have an aspirin to gain eternal peace within? It's impossible. We can't do it. It's been said that no man ever did a forbidden thing without thinking it would make him happy. And no man ever found that it did. No man ever did a forbidden thing without thinking that it would make him happy. You do it because, oh, this is going to be so good. Then you find out every time it doesn't make you happy. So verse 12, therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So we now see the law is perfect. It's holy. It's just. God gave it to his people as an expression of his will for his people. So what's the problem with it? The problem is who he gave it to. (laughs) That's us. Because we're sinful people, and we are already sinners. We needed the law, though, to point out that we were sinners, give us the knowledge of sin, and along with that knowledge, are recognizing that we need a Savior and that Jesus is that Savior. Because think about it. If, we weren't, if it wasn't pointed out to us so clearly that we're sinners, Savior, Shmavior, I'm going to do what I want. But when you realize the deep depravity of your sin in your life, you go, oh, wow. Which Paul gets into in the rest of chapter 7. You realize you really do need a Savior. Paul wrote this about the law as far as trying to live by it to make God happy. It's in Galatians 3, 10 through 12. It's in the New Living Translation. But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, Cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of the law. So if you break even one, you're cursed. And if you're trying to live by it to make God happy, you're going to fail. So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law, because we'll always fail. For the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. So it's the faith in God not obeying the law to make him happy, because you can't. This way of faith is very different from the way of the law, which says this. It is through obeying the law that a person has life. That'd be great if we could do it, (laughs) but we can't. So the faith in Jesus who kept the law for us, gives us eternal life. Pretty good deal? I think so too. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word and for using people like Paul.
people we look up to, and we find out he struggled with sin. He had struggles against it. He thought, he thought actually even, that by obeying the law, he was doing well. Then you showed him he was breaking the law, and that condemned him. But then you showed him that you completed the law. You fulfilled it. And so by that and your death and resurrection, your blood washed him clean. And his sins, though they are many and they're scarlet, you make them as white as snow. And you can do that for any person who asks you to be their Savior and Lord. So thanks, God. Thanks for explaining this, making it so clear, and for saving us. As Paul says later in 7, the wretched people that we are, you love us. Truly, it points to how great a God you are. It's correct in Isaiah when it says that you are wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.